そなたは己の務めを果たす覚悟ができておるか I want to read an email from Lucas writing in、uh, to decodingtv at gmail.com, commenting on our episode last week discussing a stick of time. Lucas writes in, I was deeply moved by the titular scene of this episode where Jin, the courtesan, beseeches Toronaga for future security for her people in Edo. I felt this was not just because it was an empathetic view of sex workers, but because of how powerful she was. I watched this scene with my partner, whose take on the scene was more or less a mirror of yours. Jin wanted something tangential to the problems of the moment and wrongly assumed Toronaga had a plan. In talking it out together, we came to an extra layer that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. The extra layer here was the intention on Jin's part. She didn't think Toronaga had a plan, she knew he didn't. She saw the peril they were all in. The show on multiple occasions has gone out of its way to let us know that the stakes, if Toronaga dies, are not just his life, but everyone in his service, including Jin. The show has spent a significant amount of time teaching us about Willow World, about the particular brand of service、uh, Jin's Tea House provides. They are ostensibly sex workers, and that can be part of it, but they do so much more than that. They talk about servicing not just a man's desires, but his needs. So Jin does not despair in the, in the face of the peril in the episode. Instead, she goes to work. Toronaga is not a man who will be moved by desire or lust, but Jin, as a master of her art, knows this. She refocuses his attention on the future, his plans for Edo, while at once ensuring a prosperous future for herself and her girls. But that's not enough because, as he points out, they're done for. So Jin reminds Toronaga of who he is. She says, Hang on, you forgot about tricks? Dude, you love tricks. And she does it in exactly the way he needs to receive it. In effect, she creates the geisha class and saves everyone in the clan, all within her tiny stick of time. I am not a book reader,、uh, so I guess it's possible that everything goes awfully, but I strongly suspect that Jin next leveled Toronaga in that scene using her master courtesan powers, and I loved it. What do you all think? End quote. This is a great interpretation, Patrick Klepek. I mean, I think you o k n we w could have spent a little more time talking about that scene with Jin and Toronaga last week. You know, I thought a lot about this. And I ultimately just think that the way that Toronaga is played is just too inscrutable for me to really come up with a conclusion for what was actually going on in that scene. Did Toronaga have the plan the whole time and Jin was reacting to the possibility that he didn't? Did Jin actually spur him to make the plan? You know, that's probably the most narratively satisfying one. That, which is what Lucas is proposing. But I guess I am curious, Patrick Klepek, if, if you had any reaction to this email and, and when Toronaga came up with a plan to triumph over his enemy. I love the interpretation.、Uh, I'm swayed by it、uh, in terms of what happened, but that's not how I felt watching.、Mm, that's not, yeah,、scene. that wasn't your、it's、interpretation. That's not how I felt when we,、yeah. we talked about it. And part of what I'm loving about this arc of the show that they you know, re- really doubled down on、um, is the central focus of. Of the episode we're about to, to talk about is like, who is Tornaga? What is the myth? Who is this person? What are they up to? What are they not up to? And it's this deconstruction of our impression of a character without any sort of interiority to that character at all. And it just leaves scenes like this so ripe for interpretation that、yeah. I think even by the end of the show, I suspect. We will not have clear answers on where, when, why,、um, even as the plan, so to speak, is becoming a little clearer to us as the viewer. What I'm suspecting will be part of the beauty of this show is you'll be able to go back to scenes like this and go, oh, this could have been exactly as this interpretation rolled out. I, I suspect that we will not, this is not going to be the kind of show that you're going to go back and be like, oh, I can directly line up right, all of、right. It's all, all locking like, into place, right? It's, it's, it, I think it's very open to interpretation, but I think Lucas's interpretation is very valid. And, and by the way, an instinct that I think was vindicated this episode, my instinct was like, hey, just don't really put too much stock into what Tornaga appears to be at any given point. Yeah. Because he could be putting on a show, he could be deceiving, you know. And that's how I felt last week is like, does he have a plan? Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. Who knows? You know, I'm not going to try to spend too much time thinking about it because I don't think the show gives you that much to go off of.、Um, but I think Lucas's interpretation is super valid. Okay. Shogun episode eight Abyss of Life. Patrick Klepek, what'd you think of the episode? Oh, man. <laughs> the amount of times in this episode where I just quietly said to myself, oh, fuck. <laughs> It's just, there are scenes in this episode that we could spend a whole episode's length、uh, dissecting, talking about. There are just 
tour de forces between actors and culminations of emotional moments. We had a lot of kind of quiet before the storm. Like this is the, like a lot of those pieces kind of coming together before a powder keg, I think is about to (laughs) explode uh, in this show. And there's just really wonderful payoffs for so many character dynamics where things that have been left unsaid between characters that we've only had a minor exposure to, but we know that these dynamics go back decades that Mm -hmm. we get payoff on. We have dynamics between characters where so much is going unsaid between them. And yet so much is being said in the subtext of what's like, it's just, man, it's, 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 it's exquisite storytelling. It is a very patient show rewarding the audience for their patience. And it makes me just so tremendously excited to see where this is all going to end, end up because it has rewarded me every step of, of the way. And it's really nice to be in a place with a show where I just know I'm going to be shocked, surprised, delighted, and laugh all in the same measure. And, and this show just seems to have it all. And I think this is a, it's not a show you could just hand to somebody out of context and be like, this is why Shogun is great. But if you've been watching the season alongside us, it feels like just a perfect encapsulation about everything that is great about this show. Um, right before a lot of people are about to die. Completely agree with you. And I think the main theme of this episode is what is the value of loyalty, right? Is there anything inherently valuable to being loyal to a thing or a person or a purpose? And this is a thing that some people on the show, at least, are asking themselves as the episode goes on. And it seems to be something that comes, uh, the show comes back to again and again. So uh, yeah, I, I thought it's, it's a very thematically rich episode. And also Patrick Lepic, it fulfills the Shogun formula that I keep saying it week after week. <laughs> Tons of people sitting around in rooms talking, punctuated with one or more shocking acts of violence. That is what this episode continues to deliver on. And I can just check it off each week as I've gotten my fill of Shogun. <laughs> You're Shogun. Talk- you have a bingo card at this point. Yep. Uh- <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about what actually happens in this episode. In the cold open, everyone is heading towards Edo, carrying the body of Toronaga's son, who died last week after getting a little bump on the noggin, if you recall. Bonk. Toronaga is given 49 days to mourn his son before being delivered to Osaka. Which, by the way, I just... <laughs> It is it is wild that all this like propriety, right, is getting in the way of Toronaga dying. It's like, hey, we gotta have an election for the regents. You know, we gotta have a, a select the fifth regent because we can't make any decisions without having five regents and uh we can't all they want to do is kill this guy. All, yeah. Everyone agrees. <laughs> this guy's gotta die, we gotta kill him. He's gotta and go. the way that loyalty, bureaucracy, honor the blurriness between those things, like what is loyalty and what is just bureaucracy, I think is one of the more fascinating like elements of, of this show. I was, I, <laughs> if I had, was drinking something, I would have coughed up water when it was clarified to me in the show that he was about to get 49 days of calm before <laughs> everything moved. I was like 49 days. You gotta be kidding me. Also uh, like his son was acting in violation of whatever orders, you know, like right. his son was trying to murder. Now he did not succeed, but uh, it, it's just, even given that they're still like, well, we got to do the honorable thing and give him 49. Days. So, <laughs> right. you know, anyway, that's right. That's how seriously they take this stuff. There are three main stories in this episode, Toronaga, Blackthorn, and all the stuff that's going down with Ishido and Lady Ochiba. So let's just talk about the, the two shorter plot lines first. Um, Ishido and Lady Ochiba. Uh, Ishido praises Lady Ochiba's genius strategy uh, by allying with Lord Seki. Uh, but Lady Ochiba is not convinced that they have succeeded. She won't be until she sees Toronaga literally underfoot in front of her. Uh, Ishido is clearly smitten by Ochiba. There's this, Patrick Klepek, there's this uh, trend on TikTok or this, this kind of um, trope on, on TikTok mm-hmm. of like, uh pov you know your guy friend is about to ruin your friendship mm-hmm. <laughs> which is like a common thing where you know a guy that your friend if you're a woman a guy you're friends with like gives you this look and you know he's about to say that he's like romantically attracted to you and therefore ruin your friendship uh definitely got a lot of ruining friendship vibes <laughs> from ishido this episode uh that and i enjoy that uh, Achiba looks at Tornaga as Jason Voorhees, uh, which uh-huh. is 
Uh, look, we can lop off his <laughs> Until arms. I see the cold yes. body dead in front yes. of me. Yes, He's until his dead. head has been lopped off. We've buried it in the ground and then burned his body to ash. <laughs> I do not believe. And, you know, she's not wrong. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, yeah. I like the way that you get such a sense of how how much she truly fears Toranaga and like the trauma that has been like imprinted on her uh, that leads this character that, you know, we described uh, just recently as like, ah, like this final boss character, but this final boss character is also like deeply afraid of this other character (laughs) over off to the side. And it's, it makes her a, a much more uh, interesting character all told. So Ishido does, ask for Ochiba's hand in marriage because he thinks this would make for a really good alliance. But think about it. But think about it. But think, think about, about it. it. Think about but think it. about it. And you can tell she's really overjoyed at the prospect. <laughs> yeah, she's thinking um, about it. <laughs> in a later scene, we see Lady Dioin gravely ill. Uh, that is the Tycho's wife, right? Uh, who is gravely ill. And there's a very moving scene when she dies. She, she tells Lady Ochiba, hey, release the hostages. End this madness. And then she also says, Ishido comes from nothing and is nothing, and, uh, which is like, wow, brutal. <laughs> uh, because she basically doesn't want him to, she, doesn't want her to marry him because she's, he's not worthy of it. Um, and she's like, just end this madness. Stop taking the hostages. You're going down a bad path, Lady Ochiba. Um, and then she dies. Her dying words are very powerful and seeing the afterlife and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I thought it was very moving, but then Ochiba seemingly disobeys her dying wishes by then deciding she's got to marry Ishido. Obviously, I think this is a main theme of the show of people being on this path of vengeance and like not being able to deviate from it, right? And that that becoming a huge problem. But any other thoughts about the Ishido and Ochiba storyline this episode, Patrick Lepic? <laughs> uh No, mostly. Uh... Yeah, it's not like uh, I'm I'm rooting for a Cheeto, but uh, also I j- I'm just sad for my boy. Like you're 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 taking a lot you're <laughs> you're taking a lot of swings that I think you're gonna whiff on here, buddy. Like the show is like clearly setting him up as I mean, over the course of the, the show's run, at, at no point is he do you see him as wow a master calculated. You know, he's essentially on the opposite end of Tornaga. Um, and here he, he's so like infatuated with Ochiba. Like it, it's, mm-hmm. it's actually kind of pathetic and I, I it's a great performance. It's like, but Oh, he's never wow, been he's... so forward about it. Right. right like it's, right. he's sort of attracted to her from afar, but he starts taking some real risks here, but like saying yeah. like, Oh, you know, our Lord, I mean, we, we revere him, but he was a real piece of shit. Like, like <laughs> we all know this. Right. And that's how he then pivots to uh, an offer for, for marriage. So he's just taking, he's, he's putting himself out there and we got to respect that, but he is a pathetic, sad boy. And none of this is going to work out for him. Um, and I'm pretty sure that uh, he is going to die in, in the coming episodes. <laughs> all right. Patrick and I have not read the book, so we're just guessing here. Yes. Uh, Want to be clear. All right. Blackthorn pays his respects to Tornaga in this episode, Mar- Mariko gives Blackthorn the book of all his terrible deeds and says he'll be released, but who knows what the upcoming regents will do to her, uh, him after they take control of the kingdom. Blackthorn tells Mariko not to go to Osaka, but her allegiance prevents her from doing anything else. Blackthorn also sees the priest, who I think is named Alvito, in the city. The priest is impressed by Blackthorn's assimilation, and Blackthorn explains his intentions to reunite with his crew and take back command of his ship. So later on, Blackthorn reunites with one of his men who is none too happy to see him. Turns out only six of the men are left, and the men he encounters blames Blackthorn for them being in this predicament where they're slowly wasting away with no prospects. The conversation takes a turn when he insults Blackthorn's outfit, causing Blackthorn to beat his ass. This is a pretty critical scene. The whole show, for the last like seven and a half episodes, Blackthorn has been trying to get back to his men. And he sees this as critical for his, he's like, he has this whole story in his head. I'm going to go back to the men. We're going to get in the ship. We're going to go back and do, have more adventures and do other stuff. And then confronted with one of his men who calls him out on his bullshit. Uh, Blackthorn does not take it well. What'd you think, Patrick Lepic? <laughs> I, saw, I saw this in a, a forum discussion on Shogun somewhere, uh, comparing the, uh, the arc of Blackthorn to uh, like, the white kid that goes do a semester abroad in Japan and then goes, I'm Japanese now. Um, 
Uh, there's a term. There's a term in gaming, or it's more, I guess, more anime. But a weeb um, is yes. how you might describe uh, Blackthorn. Um, and but it's yeah, it's the culmination of this character where whatever his identity was or lack thereof, and and like how much of of Blackthorn that we've met in those opening episodes was a performance, um, a person searching for meaning, identity, purpose uh, has found it here, and that confrontation with. Uh, you know, the, the, the folks on his ship, um, which you characterize it as multiple people. He only sees one of them. Um, he only talks yeah. to one of them. The yeah, rest yeah, yeah. are, are off screen. He doesn't correct. Correct. I, I didn't mean a, to imply that. I didn't mean no, to no, no, no. I just want to, I, I think it's, but yeah. I think it's important that he does not even make a meaningful attempt to see all of them. Right. Um, right. He sees one of them has a poor encounter. And, and what was much funnier was <laughs> he attempts to skedaddle away. Like he, he gets led there. <laughs> by somebody in the city, um, begins walking there, sees sort of, well, really an assault. He turns around. He's like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think I want to do this. And then he gets a recognize, like he was yeah. uh, leaving down a hallway at a, at a conference. And you see someone you don't actually want to say hello to. And a lot of this episode is, I think characters reaching their final form, right? Like it is, who are you as this confrontation nears its climax as as this story reaches its end and for blackthorn i think it is realizing maybe he doesn't want to go back like maybe this this is where he wants to be if he whether he can actually fit in you know i don't know the one thing um i've never quite been able to get over with this show uh is they sort of just skip over him learning how to speak japanese <laughs> <laughs> right, like really fluently. Like they still occasionally put in a sequence. I, I, I would not say he's very fluently. I, I, it's, he, it sounds like he uh, knows like a few more than more. I th- more. The character we meet at the beginning of this show, right, right, and his ability to speak the language. Yes, I'm not describing him as like fluent, but I think on the arc of not speaking and speaking, <laughs> he's more fluent than not speaking. And like, I just feel like the show. I don't buy that he's sitting around like practicing the language and the way this show displays his ability to speak very coherently with a lot of people. I'm not, it's not a huge hang up. It's just every once in a while, uh, I'm like, I don't really buy this part of Mm -hmm. the character fully. And I think that is mostly just a show has less time to spend in this world than a book does. And I just have to accept that through sheer immersion, uh, he would he would be able to pick up on it enough. It's yeah, just just like one maybe point Mariko gave him some lessons. You know, we see them speaking uh, in the backgrounds of many scenes, and so like it's possible she's like, okay, an ally means this in Japanese, or this means right. ally yeah. in Japanese. Yes. You know, like, yes. But I, I would not say he's fluent. I would say he knows a, he has an okay vocabulary and can say some sentences. That's what I would describe him as. Um, so it was enough for me, but I, I understand we don't see really any of that learning going on in the show itself. So. Where is my five minute montage set to some sad yeah. music of him working on his his You're verbs the best and adverbs? Around. <laughs> yeah. Nothing ever gonna keep me down. And then you yes. see him like you know yes. doing calligraphy and all this stuff. <laughs> yes. Anyway, yes. All right. Yes. Um, Blackthorn realizes he can't go back, so he goes to he goes begging to Yabushige. Yabushige is to go alone to Osaka and give the regents the guns and cannons, but Blackthorn doesn't actually believe he's gonna do this. Mariko is upset at Blackthorn's betrayal of Tornaga, uh, but we realize Blackthorn ultimately is a man without a people. Uh, Mariko says, quote, he believes he has no choice but to make his own fate, end quote. Uh, I, I just wanted to call out, I, I thought this whole stuff, this whole scene was very effective with Mariko translating for uh, for Blackthorn in front of Yabushige. And, and this idea of like, hey, like Blackthorn is in this place, it is a very bad place now where he feels like he doesn't belong anywhere. Right, that's a very scary, mm-hmm. upsetting place to be, and I think the show does a good job of of putting him there. Oh, one other thing I wanted to call out, by the way, Blackthorn has this conversation with one of his men. If things are going not great, but acceptable, and it's only when the person insults his clothes that Blackthorn really freaks out on him, and I think it's a sign of how much he has internalized his his new identity. Um, and like these clothes are now a part of him and they rep- he has pride in these, these clothes. And, um, and so I thought that was a nice touch that, that, that was the thing that tripped him off. It wasn't like you can make fun of his sailing abilities. You can make fun of his competence, but insult his clothes. That is too far. 
Um, well, the so, priest sets that up in the scene before. Um, mm, like yeah, as yeah, that yeah, scene right. closes, the priest points out, "Are you really going to go see them in those clothes?" And yeah. I sort of expected think- that that was a setup for him to change into something else uh, before right. he went and had that conversation. He's like, why that would, was very he's telling. basically like, why would I change my clothes? <laughs> no, these are they're, pretty sick. Actually. They're going to love, they're going to love these stitches. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any other thoughts on the Blackthorn storyline, this episode, Patrick Lubbock? No, I love this pairing though. Like the way these, like the way the show is lining up different characters into almost like, uh, uh, different um, parties from an RPG. Like, mm, yes, I like the three of these <laughs> together um, and I want to see how they right. bounce off each other. Let's talk about the main plot of the episode, Toronaga. It's Nagakata's funeral. Lord Toronaga has fallen sick and isn't showing up at the funeral. Yabushige is discussing the situation with Hiramatsu. It turns out a lot of Toronaga's generals are still wearing their armor which is a form of silent protest they want to fight. Marako meets Toronaga's granddaughter via Lady Rin and is shocked to find that Toronaga has not even met his own granddaughter yet, another sign that Toronaga is not doing well at all. After discussing some of his options with priest Alvito, Toronaga explains his intentions. He doesn't want to fight to the death because he thinks there will be too much bloodshed. He wants his vassals to sign a pledge saying that they will surrender with him. So the next morning, Toronaga requests everyone's signature. Yabushige signs, Omi signs with some hesitation, but then Toronaga's generals start rebelling. Hiromatsu then provides an ultimatum, change your mind, Toronaga, change your mind, don't surrender, fight instead, or I will commit seppuku. Toronaga does not change his mind. Uh, So Hiromatsu says, all right, I'm going to commit seppuku, and he asks Buntaro, his son, Marako's husband, to second him, which, as we all learned a week or two ago, means... The person that delivers the killing blow to cut off the person's head who's committing seppuku. Buntaro initially says he wants to die too, but but Hiromatsu says, no, you got to live. Also, you have to know what it means to be denied. Uh, I didn't fully understand what that, you know, like I I, I get the concept, but I didn't fully understand exactly. My what interpretation yeah, of yeah. that was a reflection of his relationship with Marco. That's what is, I, that was my initial reaction was like maybe he's referring to that, but I didn't. I don't. We don't hear Hiromatsu talk about that too much, so I didn't know if that that's was true. Exactly that's true. That's to, true. Yeah. But that was my first thing was like right. you must experience what she experienced, basically. You know, like to some degree. <laughs> right. Um, but m- maybe you have a different interpretation, and if you do, let us know at decodingtv@gmail.com. So then Hiromatsu commits seppuku. This scene was wild, Patrick Klepek. That was it. Was so intense and upsetting and. Hiromatsu lays bare the, his old friendship with Toronaga, and it's like, we've been friends since I was a kid. I believe this so much, I'm willing to kill myself. And Toronaga's just like, sorry, bud. Cough, you cough. Got, you got to go. <laughs> cough, cough. You got to go. You got to go. Patrick Klepek, what was your reaction to watching this? Yeah, the, the, the whole time, you're just waiting for... Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, dro- I, drop the ruse. Drop the ruse. Toronaga. Right. Like S- something. Something has got. Surely to get your because... friend's life is more important than any ruse that could re- be happening right now. And and so much of the couple last couple episodes have been around this question of what is, if anything, Toronaga up to, and this scene is the culmination of stressing not just the characters that orbit Toronaga. But the audience's patience for this character, their approach, um, what may or may not be hiding behind their actions. And it's the classic sort of setup where you're expecting at the last second, I don't know, some soldier to walk in and be like, and there's soldiers at the gates. And like everyone's got to <laughs> scatter and get up and <laughs> right. the big action that's been threatened doesn't occur. And it does. And I think the acting on display here is tremendous you know like watching Tornaga's try to hold it together like is 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 positing forward this brave depressed face but you can you know a lot is expressed in that face in that scene as you're watching it in which it is there's obviously complex emotions happening as is is his only friend right like in, in this show there's lots of people that respect Tornaga that are around Tornaga we really are only shown one person who I think you can classify as, as a close friend uh, at least. And and it is, and it is him. And so to watch all that occur, you know, you get to the end and you're like, fuck man. I, okay. 
I don't know what the next stage of this show. Is. Like, I don't know every right. situation that I've been put in where I think, all right, Tori is going to pull a rabbit out of a hat. I guess there's no hat and there's certainly no rabbit. Okay. Um, well, this is still interesting, but it's a lot more depressing than I was expecting this show to be uh, at this point, as remarkable as it is. I think that's one of the great things about the show is now look, Patrick Klepek, you and I have watched enough TV and watched enough movies and played enough video games to know that at any given point, we're going to find out it was all part of a ploy. Like, like that's <laughs> very, that's always possible for literally any show, right? Like, and so I think we all have that in the back of our mind, but what's great about this scene is it is so convincing that it convinces us, the viewer, like we, we are the regent surrogate in this scene. Like, cause mm-hmm. the purpose of Toronaga doing this is to convince people, Oh, this guy is definitely 100% no doubt going to surrender. Right. There is zero doubt. This guy is toast. He is going to surrender that it. It's a wrap for Toronaga. Right. That is the purpose of this scene. And you and I watching, I think we got, I'm not going to say a hundred percent there, but I I was 99.9% of the way there. I was like, okay, well, that's it. That's it for like, there is no, whatever doubts there were in my head before that this is all some ploy. There is pretty much no doubt now. And like, then all of right, course, this could be an interesting character study of myth, and I, I, yeah, not everything has to have. A, I, I can, I can, that can be a satisfying show. It just mm. doesn't feel like the show I was watching for a while. But that's why I'd love to be surprised. <laughs> Thank you for surprising me, show. Right, um, right. right. But, uh, but you know, leaving open the possibility that it could change. But I think it was like the the scene and the episode puts you in the perspective. Yeah. Of Toronaga's men, of the regents who are like looking at this and being like, oh, th- there's only one outcome for this, and that's Toronaga surrendering. And and it's cool that it kind of puts you in that position as an audience. Later on, we discover uh Toronaga and Morocco meeting, and it was all a ploy, you see. It was a ruse, Patrick Lepic. Mm. Hir- Hiromatsu had to die to convince everyone that Toronaga was really gonna surrender. A lot of information to find out for Marco in about a one minute time period. <laughs> I really like her quote where he's like, Hey, what's your opinion on what happened? You know? And she says, we've all suffered a deep loss today. I will not deepen our suffering by like sharing my opinion on this. <laughs> yeah. Which I'm like, like I'm asshole. Do- basically. Yeah. <laughs> I- <laughs> Which is the most passive aggressive way of saying you fucked up. You fucked yeah. up. Yeah. Real I big. suppose this was the only way to get to this point. <laughs> Dipshit. <laughs> Just start adding dipshit next to all of Mariko's translations. <laughs> yeah, and it, it actually yeah. makes the show make a lot more sense, <laughs> in my opinion. <sighs> so anyway, Mariko, uh, Tornaga asks Mariko, are you ready to fulfill your mission? And she says, I am ready. Ooh, I have a feeling it's going to involve infiltrating Osaka and killing a bunch of dudes, Patrick Puppet. <laughs> we'll see. Hmm. Hmm. Yabushige is so disgusted by Tornaga's actions, he teams up with Blackthorn. Uh, Omi declines. He says, goodbye. Goodbye, uncle. You're you're on your own on this one. And Mariko shows up to accompany Yabushige and Blackthorn to Osaka. Uh, and then in one final scene, Toronaga thanks his son and Hiromatsu for giving Toronaga a little bit of extra time. That was very powerful as well, I thought. Uh, any thoughts on these scenes? There's a couple of other scenes we got to cover. But mm-hmm. yeah, any any thoughts on the ending of the episode? When you found out it was all a ploy, like how shocked were you? You know, what was your reaction? Not sh- not sh- shocked. I guess the I guess what was fascinating is is really just echoing our thoughts on the previous scene, which is they really dragged it out. Like they they just put you as a viewer and honestly all these characters through the mud to get to this point. Like we <laughs> right. how, how many times have you and I watched stories that are built around this very same set up and conceit when it's like aha the, the the person at the head of this like they're up to something L- and literally, it's revealed literally every single heist film ever made <laughs> sure yes has yes. that moment it's a genre of like it was all part of the plan to have everyone die you know like that's that's every and, heist film ever made yeah and what i like about this is how long it takes to get to the moment where there's a sense of a plan um but also there's so much suffering to get to that point. I, it is not as though often when in, you know, like in, in your example of a heist, it's like, oh, like 
here's like, let's look back on all the scenes we just looked at from a slightly different perspective and how it all fits together. And that's not really what's happened here. Like Toronaga has killed his best friend. Like he has done despicable acts in order to make the, to, to, to do this, this next desperate act that has no guarantee of success. It may, it may just amount to a bunch of people dying fruitlessly in pursuit of like, there's nothing about this, like the show, it's final like scenes with Mariko and Tornaga, certainly like, you know, the, the close-ups is like, all right, like they've got a plan. But when you step away from it a little bit, I feel, I, I feel more in Mariko's shoes in her original response. It was like this, this is the plan. Like, this is how we got here. And I'll be curious to see how that plays out through the rest of the show. Cause the way this story has played out so far, I don't expect like the next two episodes to be triumphant necessarily. Like it's a plan, but I really don't think it's going to be. And they marched into Osaka and all of their enemies died. And then Japan was saved. You know what I mean? Like, I just don't think that's the kind of story being told here. And it makes me very curious to see what are the consequences of Torananga's approach to arriving at this plan? Because it wasn't clean getting here. And I suspect it will not be clean on the other side either. Probably going to be a Pyrrhic victory. Best case scenario, Patrick. Yeah, Klopik yes, is my, 100%. It's my guess. Let's talk about a few other scenes that happened in this episode. Uh, so there was a scene with Mariko and Butaro. You know, Buntaro asks to make her tea. Um, he uses cha, uh, refers to it as cha. It's, it, ma, cha is matcha, green tea. Um, and he he serves her tea, and it's a, a wonderful performance. And Buntaro reminisces about their first days together. They were happy, but Mar- Marco struggles to remember. Um, and Buntaro proposes they die together to protest Toronaga's orders. And you might think to yourself, Marco would jump at the chance because she's been wanting to die for quite some time. Uh, but then she says, quote, even now you fail to understand what you've denied me wasn't death. It was a life beyond your reach. I would sooner live a thousand years than die with you like this, end quote. Cold blooded, Patrick Lepic. What do you think? Well, it, it, it at least confirmed my theory from before when Buntaro asked Tornaga for a chance to kill um, uh, Blackthorn. And he was told, well, then you got to kill your wife, too. That's what you're proposing here. And he was unable to do that. And my my reading on that was for as bad as a husband, as a partner, as a person as he has been, like we've seen that manifestly in the show. He is an awful, awful person and has treated Mariko very, very poorly. He still loved her and wanted her to love him. He's done nothing to earn that from her, um, even after they their pairing was uh, a matter of circumstance as opposed to choice. Uh, And so to the arrogance of Buntaro to arrive at this moment and make those sort of presumptions about how their lives should end. I mean, I'm not shocked given everything we've seen about Buntaro to this point, but I think that's why Marco acts as sharply as she does in response, because she is only able to take the performance so far until he stretches it to the point of how could what life have you been living like I, like what mara like what world of our relationship have you been telling yourself because it doesn't exist and she just she cuts them down part of them sure is you know informed by the fact that she thinks they're all about to die so <laughs> might as well be honest with each other but um it's just but it, tur- it's it just- turns out it turns out Patrick, and this is a lesson i've had to learn Putting on a nice performance and serving someone tea doesn't make up for being a dick to them for years. Like that's just kind of <laughs> really, really sad that that's what it's come to on the show, you know. But uh, I, if I had to learn the lesson, so does Buntaro. That's what I have to yeah, say about no, it. No, so. that's fair. That's fair. A <laughs> right. uh, couple of other scenes: uh, the priest and the courtesans. We see uh, Toranaga meets with the priest, and he's unhappy with him because he didn't really fulfill his end of the bargain. He tried. <laughs> But he's unable to get two of the other regents to ally with him. But Toranaga still gives him his church. Uh, the priest, though, is unhappy to discover that the courtesans will be his neighbors. <laughs> that was great. Uh, so. What a good, what a good, what a good yes. uh, kick in the balls right yeah. at the end there. Oh my gosh, the best land possible in Edo. It's like that scene from The Simpsons of, uh, that's good, that's bad, you know. You get a church in Edo, <laughs> that's good. 
It's right next to all these courtesans. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, there was a nice quote from that scene where Omi's hanging out with Lady Kiku. And he says, I don't know what I'm fighting for anymore. And she says, if you look and see nothing, you must simply look harder. End quote. And I thought that was very, very interesting. It's about basically, I think it's about the ways that we make meaning for ourselves. You know? Mm -hmm. I read this book a long time ago by Errol Morris, not too long ago, like within the last 10 years, uh, called Seeing is, uh, uh, Believing is Seeing. You know, and this 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 idea of um, we we have in our mind this idea of like seeing is believing. Like once you see it, you then believe it to be true. But the, the book, the book kind of put forward the idea of like, what if it's actually your beliefs that are driving what you see? You know, what if it's your beliefs that that drive how you interpret the world? And he provides some very convincing uh, examples of that. So anyway, I thought that was a very powerful idea of like. Hey, if you don't see meaning, like you keep, gotta keep looking until you see meaning, you know. And that's, I think, what a lot of people on the show do to their benefit and or detriment. Any other thoughts on these scenes or this episode of the show, Patrick Webber? Uh Upon further reflection on the uh, the scene where Buntaro asked to take his life, and his father rejects the opportunity, I think we're right that you can read it as the reflection on his relationship with Marco, but given, as you pointed out, the lack of any sort of discussion on that, when I've thought about it further, as we've gone through this podcast, the more I think about it, it's like, it's his father saying, look at what's happening right here. These are two people at the end of their life, having a profound disagreement. Me choosing to take my life because of this disagreement is the greatest honor I can show this relationship. You do not have like, to be denied is like you need to earn the right to have something that means that much that you can commit this act mm -hmm, to have mm -hmm. it mean something. And so I think you can then take that and transplant that to the T scene. And in, in some ways, Mariko is is denying him. Well, he, he but, has denied her request to take her own life many times, right? Right. But I, is, I think is, that is just broadly thing. speaking, he is saying like, even, like I think you can apply it to the Mariko relationship. But I think just broadly, he's like, you need to live a life long enough, full enough that you can actually have something that would justify an act like this. And you have not, you have not reached it. And that's why you are, you're being denied. And that's kind of how I, after talking through the stuff here, that's kind of how I end up sitting with that, with that scene. That's a cool interpretation, Patrick Lepic. I'm also just going to throw this out there on a practical level. They want, he wants Bintaro to live to, to <laughs> yeah, sure. Tornaga. Yeah. He's yep. like, yep. Hey, you got to stick around because the reason I'm killing myself is so Tornaga can accomplish this mission. So, final question, Patrick Klepik. Uh, Tornaga actually sick? Question mark or uh, no, faking not, it? Not a chance. Not a chance. He's uh, I mean, I think he's sad. You know, I, he, <laughs> his his son was a a goofball. Um, but I think I think he is. I think this is all part of a part of an act. He wants, if there are spies, if there are any observers, to to send word back that Tornaga is a sad, pathetic man and. He's about to roll over, and those around him are ready to revolt. Hey everyone, David Chen here. Thank you so much for watching that video from Decoding TV. If you want to get an audio version of the show, all you got to do is go to podcast.decodingtv.com. And if you want to support what we do, get ad-free episodes of the podcast and also bonus episodes of the podcast, go to decodingtv.com and become a paid member. Of course, you can also like and subscribe for more. We appreciate it. Thanks. See you later.